Luke, the so-called anthropic principle um, on one day, I think, is the most trivial, um, <laughs> non-useful tautology I've ever heard. It just does the same thing over and over again. You can only be where, where, um, where you can be, essentially. Uh, on other days, I think it's one of the most probative <laughs> ways we have of understanding reality. Um, so, from your point of view, uh, how does the anthropic principle relate to fine-tuning? So, I think of the fine-tuning principle as a selection effect. So, to an astronomer, these are very, very common uh, things to worry about. It sounds trivial to say that when you point a telescope at the night sky, you'll only see the things that are bright enough to see. <laughs> that sounds trivial, but actually astronomers spend an awful lot of their time worrying about this sort of thing because it, it has a very important effect. So what it, there's a sort of explanation it won't give you. So if, if we see a distant quasar in the universe and you wonder, you know, it's a long way away, it looks very bright, why are quasars so bright? The answer to that question is not because otherwise we wouldn't see them. <laughs> That's the wrong sort of explanation. But if you're wondering why galaxies seem to get bigger the further away you look, yeah. that's actually just a selection effect. Even if galaxies were the same anywhere, you don't, the ones far away, you'd only see them if they were very bright. So that's a selection effect. I think the, the uh, anthropic principle is that sort of thing. If you had a, a population of universes out there with lots of different properties, and you say, what would I expect to observe if I was in one of these universes? Well, the universe has got to make the observer first. So you would only expect to see universes which made observers. Mm -hmm. That's on one level trivial in the same way that you only see things that are bright enough to see is <laughs> trivial. On the other hand, if you have a model of the multiverse, if you have the population of universes out there, it can really do some explaining for you as to what you would expect to observe in that multiverse. Mm. Uh, physicists are uh, heatedly uh, in dispute about the uh, relevance or importance or danger mm. of the anthropic principle. Some would say that if you, if you invoke it, you are giving up and you are admitting defeat and you are limiting the, cap the capacity of science uh, to progress. Mm. So I don't take that particular view because and cosmology is supposed to be modeling the entire universe. And so you're, you're always modeling a system that you yourself are a part of. And you can't pretend to be outside of that system. So I like to think of it as, as you know, Frankenstein. You, we are not Dr. Frankenstein. We didn't build this lab and have it make some life over there. You know, we're the monster. We, yeah. we woke up in a laboratory yeah. and are trying to work out how it made us. Yeah. So. I think if thinking of the anthropic principle purely as a selection effect, it's, it's, it's unavoidable if you're doing cosmology. You're in the system. You can't avoid the fact that the system must make you before you observe it. But uh, over the years, uh, there's been these other sort of ideas about what the anthropic principle means, and some of those are much more speculative. They aren't just uh, selection effects. Some of them are, are, are very sort of out there, wacky like ideas. What? So when when Brandon Carter first talked about the strong anthropic principle in yeah. the 1970s, what he meant was that he, applying the idea that we can only observe, you know, a universe that creates observers to the fundamental constants and properties of the universe. That's, that's what he meant. His weak anthropic principle was we, we apply it to when we see the universe and where we are in the universe. But in the 1980s, uh, John Barrow and Frank Tipler wrote a book called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, um, in that, they redefine the strong, strong anthropic principle to be much more broad and not just a selection effect. In, in many ways, it's, it, it was a, a, a real statement about how the universe is that it must make life at some stage or it must make observers for some reason. That, I take, is, is a different kind of principle. It's not a strong version of the same thing. It's just a totally different thing. And if that's what you think the anthropic principle is, then it's suddenly, it's controversial, it's very speculative, it looks like you know, mysticism. Uh, so I think that, that redefinition has given the whole enterprise, even the, the totally un, uncontroversial selection effect, uh, sort of a bad name amongst physicists. Yeah, and so um, how do you, in 
contemporary physics, how is it being used? I mean, what are some examples? So I think when you've got a multiverse model, you have this population of other universes. And we don't just pick one at random to go and have a look at, right? We're not, we're not Frankenstein, mm -hmm. we're the monster. We wake up in one of these universes. Why does it have these properties? Part of the reason for that is because that was the universe that could make someone to wake up and have a look around. And I think within that context, the anthropic principle really does some explaining. Uh, what are specific cases where uh, anthropic reasoning has, uh, has, uh, has helped uh, uh, discover a, 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 a principle in physics? So one of the most famous cases was uh, Steven Weinberg in the 80s said, we, we, there's this thing called vacuum energy, it would act like a cosmological constant, we don't know why it has, we don't want it, what its value is or why it would have any value rather than another one, let's just assume that there's a population and then apply this selection effect idea. So if the cosmological constant is too large, those universes are all dead, they don't make any structure. But within the ones that do make structure, let's apply anthropic principle, we would be typical of that set. And so we would expect to see a non-zero cosmological constant. We'd expect to see a constant of roughly the size that would allow for structure to form. And he did that in the 80s, and 10 years later we found out actually that prediction wasn't too bad. It was in, within a factor of 10 order of magnitude of the actual answer. So that's an interesting case of the only, the only reasoning that saw a cosmological constant coming was this anthropic style reasoning. Mm -hmm. are, are there more recent uh, examples? Not really, actually. It's interesting. Uh, we've tried to push beyond just the cosmological constant to some of these other cosmic uh, parameters. The problem is they're not really predictions, they're, they're coming after we've learned what the number right. is. So it was only Weinberg who really got in ahead of time. Right. And, but even so, we could try to post predict things. And, and those predictions have some degree of, of plausibility. So Q, for example, the amount of lumpiness in the universe, we, we could, if that varies among the, the, the uh, uh, in the multiverse, then we have some understanding of why it's 10 to the minus 5, but it seems like it could be a bit larger and we'd still be okay. So that's a marginal case where maybe we could understand it in, in these terms. But So, so currently, uh, what's the uh, reputation of the anthropic principle uh, in, in, in populations of uh, physicists, of, um, of uh, believers who are science-oriented? Uh, how are, what, what's, what's its current uh, status? Its current status depends on whether people think of it in terms of Carter's original, it's just a selection effect, in which case it's uncontroversial. If there's no multiverse, it doesn't make much of a difference. If there is, it will do some explaining. If they think it's one of these other, you know, Barrow strong, uh, uh, strong anthropic principles or, or uh, you know, uh, other speculative ideas, they will generally have less acceptance uh, in the community.